CEO of Atlantic, uh, which is a consulting firm, specialty firm, uh, in helping uh, companies enter international markets. So uh, why don't you join me in giving a hand to our moderator, Richard, and he's going to take us away. Thank you very much. I, uh, I do appreciate that. We'll just wait for this gentleman uh, to have a seat. And what I plan to do today is uh, to moderate from a, a, an arm's length. Uh, I will introduce the uh, four esteemed panelists, let them uh, tell you a little bit about their positions, their challenges, the issues and successes, and uh, anything else they feel is appropriate for about five or six minutes each. We will then open it up to questions as the main reason you're here today and the main reason the panelists are here today is to interact with you. So I'm going to do my best to butcher the, uh, the four last names here, um, but I'm going to start off with introducing uh, Elisa Piska. Yeah, pretty close, okay. <laughs> Elisa is Vice President of Recruitment and Expansion at Greater Portland Inc., which is a regional economic development partnership in the Portland-Vancouver area, which includes seven counties and covers two states. We then have Tom Schauer. Sorry, Tim. Sorry, you changed seats on me. Tim. Uh, and Tim is President and CEO of McKay Sposito, Inc., a Vancouver professional services consulting firm. And to his right is Todd Coleman, who is the CEO of the Port of Vancouver. And right at the end, I think you uh, you travel possibly the furthest today on our panel. Do you get that award? Oh, actually, I live in Vancouver. You do? Vancouver. Oh, okay. Well, Sheila Hoss is Governor Jay Inslee's regional representative for Southwest Washington and the Governor's Director of International Relations and Protocol. Before I uh, let things uh, loose with the panel, I, I wondered if uh, I could have a, a show of hands. Who, who's actually from Clark County here in the room? Okay, so the vast majority of you. Any students back there? <coughs> One, well done, good. And who uh, in the audience is involved or owns a business that is actively exporting right now or has plans to this year? Hmm. Well done, that's fantastic. So I'm gonna just turn it over uh, for a few minutes to each of the panelists, so uh, if we can just start on the left and flow to the right. Elisa, if you'd like to uh, take it away for us. Right. Good morning, everyone. What I'll do is go over um, what Greater Portland Inc. does, what our uh, unique uh, mission is within the realm of economic development, and then touch on a few of our challenges that we're facing. So Greater Portland Inc. is a regional economic development organization. It's funded about 50-50 through private and um, um, government entities. So it's a similar model to CRBC, which many of you are familiar with. However, what we do is we represent six counties, two states, and about 26 cities, two ports. So we have many people interested in what we're doing in the economic development realm. But at the flip side, what we also have is a great advantage of selling all of the assets within the region. From my perspective, my job is to go out and market and promote this region for business. I think we all would agree we've done a pretty good job of promoting this region from the natural resource aspect, the tourism, the food, and so forth. But we haven't been doing as well is promoting it for, from a business perspective. And we've got a great story to tell. And that story is really compelling when you can look at, we've got Sharp, we've got Wafer Tech, we've got Intel, we've got Nike, we've got... So when you look at the combined regional assets, it's really a compelling story. And so Greater Portland Inc. has been in um, operation for about two years, so we are way behind the curve. Um, 
regions such as Austin, Denver, you name it, have been doing this for close to 15 to 20 years. So we're doing a lot of catch up, um, but we are there. Um, our organization has spent about two years really building the foundation. The first thing we really needed to do was make sure the region understands we have got to unify regionally in, e in order to compete globally. And I think we're all there, and I think Vancouver, the Clark County, and I think it goes back to the point that Rick Good made earlier. This recession has really forced us to collaborate and look at things differently. And Greater Portland Inc. is the regional organization that can pull everyone together. And so what I'm doing, I just got back, for example, from um, San Francisco last night, meeting with different regions where we can really sell our region and let them know that we are a great place to come. Um, probably the biggest challenge I'm facing right now is I think one of the pushbacks we get um, is from the incentive play, because we're looking at national um, companies looking at coming to the region. Um, the frustration, and I think this is playing out, and you can probably see it, New York Times is reporting on it, a lot of governing magazines, site selectors, is this war going on in the incentive realm, and it does no favors for anybody. Fortunately, when I, speak with, when I spoke with a site selector in New Jersey, West Coast kind of has a reputation, it's known we are not your incentive play like the Midwest or the Southeast, but it's really a frustrating position. But what we can counter that with and what we do counter it with, we are an amazing talent attractor. And that was one of my points in the piece before this, is even though our education system might not be generating the engineers and STEM students to the degree that we need to serve our local economy, that's a national issue though. We need to recognize that's just not unique to here. We need STEM across the nation. We can attract the talent here like no one else. And it's really a unique aspect that we're out promoting. So that's what re we're really countering is we are not your low cost option. We are not gonna be, uh, we can't do that. We, uh, but what we do have is this amazing ability to keep and retain talent. So I'll keep it to there as to continue some other points. Thank you. And uh, Tim, uh, if you could stick to sort of six or seven minutes, uh, sure. that would be great. Thank you. Um, before I comment too much, I, I want to paint a little picture of who I am so you can choose to increase or decrease the grain of salt which you add to my comments. <laughs> um, I grew up in Clark County, I graduated from Ballard High School, went away and came back. I've been at the same company since I graduated. Um, I've been there 23 years. Um, I'm an advocate for being involved in your community, I'm the past chair of the chamber. Commerce, I'm an incoming chair of the CRDC, I sat on the Governor's Transportation Task Force. Um, I believe one of the best ways to be informed about growing your markets is to participate in your community and be informed. More information is better. And don't assume you know everything. A little bit about our firm. Uh, the recession uh, was very painful for us, but we experienced it much earlier, probably 05, 06, we saw a big downturn. And uh, the good fortune for us, which led us to expanding our markets, was we were forced to recalibrate and retool probably a year to two years before everybody else did. You know, when you realize you're hungry and you have to look for new opportunity, um, you're just being fortunate that everybody else isn't looking at the same time. So for us, um, we went through some foundational changes, which I'll share a, a, a few, I guess my, my recipe for expanding and, and to diversify. Since that time, we have uh, doubled in size, in the last three years, we've made fastest growing company in, in Washington. So, Puget Sound Business Journal, Port Business Journal, Vancouver Business Journal, our industry, industry, industry magazines, White and White's newest, the top firm, fastest growing engineering companies in the country, top 100, maybe 5,000 this year. Um, lots of things that are um, interesting uh, to talk about growth, but the challenge to be growing and be profitable. Growth in itself doesn't necessarily define success. So measured discipline is something that I would add. I would say that um, my advice to professional service industries, if you'd like to grow into new markets, is to first look at how you define yourself. So if you define yourself by what you do and where you do it, you're not positioned to expand into new markets. Um, you know, if you're a, if you're a Vancouver-based company and that's where you lead your title with, it's hard to go somewhere else. All you're talking about is where you're from and you're not local. If there is a, down economy, in a recovering economy, folks are generally suspicious of service firms in their market coming to do work. They're an outsider. So look at your
yourself and decide how you define yourself. Are you defined by your region or your service area? Um, and try to present yourself in a way that is less about you. We have a team, a strategic, a strategic consultant we, we share work with, has a nice phrase that stuck with us a few years ago. Is we don't we we on our clients, which is sort of a funny thing. We don't talk to our clients about what we do and what we are. It's all about us. It's really more about what your client needs what your market needs, and define yourself around them, not around you. The other thing that was foundational for us that I would encourage you to think about if you wanted to look into new markets and to expanding is how you define a market. For us, a market is always three-dimensional. It's not just about regions. Folks talk about markets and they say, well, we're going to go to Tri-Cities, we're going to go to California, we're going to go to Idaho and work. That's a new market. A new market for us is any time you change the client, the region, or the service. So if you're doing, if we're not providing land surveying, for example, in a certain region, we decide to add that. That's a new market. And when you start to think that way, um, you recognize that when you start to do something that isn't a new market, and you don't recognize it as that, you think it's just adding something to an existing location, to an existing client, you don't take the approach you should. You should define that as a new market. And those are challenges that present themselves um, that aren't always very obvious. The other is, uh, we chose to define ourselves and our markets not by what we do, but really more by where the revenue stream is. Um, I like a mining analogy. It's like we were cross mining um, or cross fracking. Um, we were going across the grain. And then when you realize that you're going across the grain, if you can turn those, those that, that, that microscope really down the, the vein of work, it can be much more efficient for you. Some examples. So for us, we uh, today, 70% of our work is in the energy sector. Zero four years ago, five years ago. Five years ago, zero. Now what do I mean when I say energy sector? I'd also say we do no energy generation, no energy design. We define energy as any project that exists because there is an energy revenue stream. For example, lots of hydro around the Northwest. Utilities and hydro, hydro agencies that are doing mitigation measures, they're building a new park. What used to be a boat launch and a campground was a recreation project, is now an energy project for us. When you collect your work around the revenue streams that are in common, as opposed to around the kind of project it is, you find you can chase a client, as opposed to chase a project. And uh, that was really foundational for us. Um, land surveying for a power line is not a, a topographic survey anymore, same concepts around transportation, infrastructure, residential development. A park project for a developer is not a park project. A developer is building a subdivision or a large community. That's a land development project. So we realized that we could reverse that look at our work, reorganize it. And one of my partners refers to it as a Rubik's Cube. You just turn the cube to another side and look at it and you realize what things you have in common that you didn't see before. It allows you to be much more targeted and efficient. We talk about chasing clients, and chasing relationships, not chasing projects. So professional service firms, there's lots of opportunity because many regions aren't doing it right and they're not, and they're not, they're not as lean as this community has been. Coming out of a community where we had such a downturn, if you're still in business today, you're a much better business person probably than you were five years ago. And other areas work hard as hit as us. So we go out and look and realize we're pretty well equipped here um, to have survived this downturn. skills than others. So I'd encourage you as, a, as in the service industry folks, if you want to look to other areas within the Northwest specifically, um, we used to work in two states, we're now in six. We used to have three service areas, now we have five. Um, and it really has been um, just strong will and willing to travel. So thank you, Tim. Todd, could you uh, tell us a little bit about how things are at Fort these days? Any fun. issues? <laughs> <laughs> Thankful Tim brought up fracking. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Well, good morning. Again, it's my pleasure uh, to be part of the Columbia's Economic Development uh, Forecast. Uh, as always, I think the speakers were very good and very thought provoking, and uh, they always put together a, a great group. But I also look forward to uh, this panel discussion because I know that uh, this is my third or fourth time on this panel. Uh, it's always an opportunity to hear.
hear uh, from my colleagues about the tremendous efforts underway uh, to make Vancouver and Clark County a more vibrant community. And this year is no different again. Very talented, bright individuals sharing their opinions, and I appreciate their time to do that. So I am Todd Coleman. I'm the CEO of the Port of Vancouver, and I'm just finishing up my 13th year at the Port, actually about three days ago. Uh, but my 13 years is only a speck uh, in the 202 years uh, that the Port has been investing in infrastructure in this community. Uh, since I started working with the Port about 20 years ago, and that includes my time as a consulting engineer, uh, the Port has partnered with the community to invest over $250 million in infrastructure. That infrastructure includes docks, Mill Plain, 26th Avenue, West Vancouver Freight Access, Gateway Avenue, and a number of other projects. And if you've heard me speak at the, this forecast breakfast before, uh, you know that we are seeing a return on that investment today as a result of those infilled investments. And though marine cargo tends to be cyclical, we have seen booming years with wind energy and uh, project cargoes. Um, companies like United Grain Corporation, BHP Wilton, Far West Steel, uh, Sapa Profiles, and Tesoro Savage are partnering with the port and the community and investing over $500 million of their own private dollars. The importance of these new investments is not meant to take anything away uh, from our existing customers. The port is extremely fortunate to have a different path of great diversity in its cargo um, and tenant mix, and today the port and our plant partners handle grain, corn, soybeans, bentonite clay, scrap steel, paper pulp, malt, steel, lumber, wind cargo, modules, rock crushers, western star trucks, Subaru cars, um, copper concentrates, steel slag, diesel, biodiesel, methanol, jet fuel, sodium hydroxide, phenol, urea, bauxite, transformers, and all sorts of other types of commodities. They're vast, they're very diverse. We also have tenants that manufacture aluminum parts, heaters, flameless fireplaces, cabinets, rebar, steel parts, and concrete, as well as canning uh, fruits and vegetables. And we have partners that transload flour, salts, oils, lumbers, steel, automobiles, homebrew kits, and a number of other things. So you can see that our mix is hugely diverse, and many of these things uh, most people don't even know that we handle on a daily basis. All of these customers are experts in their areas, and they bring economic benefits to our community every single day. And for that, we're thankful for their investments and for their dedication. Uh, we at the Port are continuously co uh, combing the global market, searching for new markets. <coughs> but as we explore the globe for new opportunities, I'd like to offer a word of caution. I believe that as a community, we need to be very, very careful that we don't pit economic development against livability. It is all far, part of the same package. It's the yin and the yang. Economic development and livability are not mutually exclusive. Right now, if you read the Columbian, or frankly, if you breathe, you know that a project at the port is at the center of a very dynamic community conversation. This conversation is happening at a time when our region, our nation, and the world is debating the use of fossil fuels. But regardless of how you feel about the project, I do not for a second believe that a vibrant city and a thriving industrial area are mutually exclusive. As a matter of fact, we believe it is our responsibility to make sure that they can coexist. It's been a part of our core values for over 100 years now, and I would expect it to be for the next 100 years. You see, in 100 years from now, we will not be here, but the port will be, and the community will be. Therefore, we must have a longer-term vision than our own lifespan. Creating an environment where a vibrant uh, city coexists with the thriving uh, industry uh, area takes work. But the key is that we do not need to choose one over the other. We just have to work hard if we want to become a world-class community. There are endless examples of how it's been done successfully around the world. You see it frequently when you travel to Europe, but it's a little bit closer to home. You see it in the Pearl District in Portland, you see it in the waterfront in Seattle, in San Francisco, and my very, very favorite, uh, Vancouver, BC. The diversity of that community uh, creates such a unique vibrancy. To make it work, we must partner. We must all participate in the conversation around important issues. Our involvement makes for a better process. Strong communities figure out how to do this. 
They find common goals and they work through disagreements so that everyone can move forward together. Our community's history is rich in examples of successful partnerships, and partnerships are more important now than they have ever been. I've seen this play out in community after, uh, in community after community in my career. Growth is very difficult. We all want to have a thriving <clears throat> community, but we also like our hometowns for its characteristics. That's why many of us chose to live in, particular, in any particular area. But isn't that why we're all here at this economic forecast breakfast? We see economic development as a necessity for us to continue to have a thriving community. We are growing, and with growth, there are difficult choices to make, and those choices will shape our forecast for decades. Stewardship must be our focus. Just like all of you, I want my family to be safe, healthy, happy, and financially stable, and I want my community to reflect those same priorities. Right now, the Tesoro Savage Oil Terminal Project is going through an extremely rigorous and comprehensive review process. Probably the most rigorous I have seen, have ever seen, or likely will ever see. At the end of that process, a group of really smart people will have provided oversight and input into this very important project. They will have listened to hours of public testimony. They will have gone through a complete judicial hearing process. They will require safety precautions, they will require environmental considerations, and they will make a recommendation to the governor who appointed them to this very important board, a board like none other. Surely they have no interest in disappointing the governor. At the end of that process, we'll know whether or not Tesoro can operate safely in our community. This is how the process should work. It's a great process. I told someone the other day, look, I'm a marathon runner, not a sprinter. So if you look at this review process like a marathon, we are maybe on mile four of 26.2. There's a long way to go. We have plenty of time to let the process work. The board's expectation has always been that the project must be the state of the industry facility when it comes to safety. But whatever happened, ultimately happens with the project, it's only one decision in a continuum of choices that this community will face. These decisions will center around how we move forward on building a sustainable community. We must be dedicated on the health of our economy, our community, and the environment. So when I look to the future, that's how I think we turn promise into prosperity. We find the right balance. We partner as a community to ensure that we have the right balance to make a vibrant community with abundant opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Shula for the next few minutes, but uh, before I do, I have to say that I have uh, job title Envy. Shula has uh, the title of Director of International Relations and Protocol. I think maybe you could spend a few seconds explaining what, what that means, what is your daily job. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with everyone. In the uh, Inslee administration, I was asked to take on uh, responsibilities related to international relations. And uh, this has been uh, part of the governor's focus on developing uh, international trade and attracting international investment. So it's a very important and strategic part of the governor's initiative to really uh, take advantage of the rest of the world out there in terms of economic development potential and market opportunities. I um, have been responsible for organizing the governor's trade missions. We've had two. We uh, attended the Paris Air Show, which uh, has taken on greater significance in terms of potential for Washington in light of the Boeing 777X decision to build here. And I also was involved in organizing one to China, which uh, was very significant in terms of identifying opportunities for the state of Washington. I work very closely on uh, missions from foreign countries coming into the state of Washington and have also hosted a number of government officials from Asia, Europe, uh, uh, Latin America, who have come looking at opportunities in Washington as well. Uh, one very large event we hosted was uh, an event for 250 businessmen coming from Japan who were, who were looking to make investments in the area. Numerous delegations from China, many delegations again from Europe. 
So the governor has asked me to participate in, uh, again, building the ties and relationships with the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is quite large. <laughs> um, you know, the U.S. population is uh, less than 5% of the global population. The dynamic growth that has occurred, uh, particularly in Asia, is mind-boggling. The opportunities that have occurred as a result of Washington's uh, unique position in the aerospace industry and in several other high-tech industries uh, gives us a, a, a very interesting platform to build relationships. And as a result, I think uh, something that is very exciting, particularly for Clark County in Southwest Washington, is an opportunity to become a player in that global market. What, one of the things that we have going for us here that's a huge benefit to us is what I call the Washington brand. When I'm in Shenzhen, China, when I'm in Paris, people know Washington. They know Boeing. They know Microsoft. They know Amazon, they know Costco, they know Starbucks. So the Washington brand has a tremendous cachet around the world. And it's associated with innovation, quality, and uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very positive association. So if you look at it at the highest levels, one of the great advantages I think that people here in Clark County have is that they can play on the Washington brand which is one of the best recognized brands globally. And one of the prime uh, objectives of, of our trade missions in particular, and a lot of our efforts in connecting with foreign governments, is to promote the Washington brand and represent to foreign governments and corporations that you know, we have something that's special and unique that has spawned some of the most innovative and important companies in the world. There's something in our water, there's our special DNA, whatever you want to call it, but we have fostered some of the greatest brand names globally, and uh, that has had tremendous benefit for some of the smaller companies, and particularly those seeking to enter into new markets. So that, that is something that is uh, of great benefit to virtually any company here in Clark County, Washington. Huge opportunity. But there have been some changes in the global marketplace that uh, actually significantly enhance the ability of our companies to participate in the global marketplace. Boeing knows how to sell aircraft all around the world. Starbucks can open a coffee shop in any country on the planet. The big companies have been very, very successful because they've had sophistication, they've had marketing acumen, they've had huge financial resources. But there are some changes in the global marketplace that have, have occurred that really have opened up opportunities to small and medium-sized enterprises, dramatically, dramatically changing the dynamic. The first thing that uh, has happened is that transportation and logistics has revolutionized our ability to move products around the globe. It is interesting that you can actually get a box of from Wenatchee, Washington to Shanghai, China faster than you can get it to Vancouver, Washington. They pick pairs at 4 in the morning, it's on a truck by 6, it's at SeaTac by 10, 12 hours later it's landed in Shanghai and uh, immediately distributed to end users. That could never happen before because of the logistics supporting the rapid and efficient movement of goods globally simply didn't exist. That infrastructure wasn't there. But it's not just the speed by which you can move things. It's the amount by which you can move things. We sell tens of millions of dollars of hay, hay, to the Middle East. Now how in the heck can we take a low value product ship it halfway around the world and make money doing it. It's because of the incredible efficiencies of bulk shipping. I mean, it is amazing the amount of product that we can move globally at uh, relatively inexpensive cost. 
The hay growers tell us it's easier to ship hay to the Middle East than it is to ship it to some parts of the United States that lack the, uh, the infrastructure to support the efficient movement. So you take the ability to move things quickly, you take the ability to move things in large bulk and quantity, and it's revolutionizing you know, our role in the global marketplace. You can be small, fast, and nimble. You can be large, thoughtful, and dynamic. It doesn't matter. You can work both ends of the spectrum as a company in Washington today. Something else that has had incredible impact, mind-boggling implications for commerce, particularly in uh, smaller communities and with small and medium-sized companies, is the internet. Alibaba is the Amazon of China. It's actually two and a half times larger than Amazon and eBay combined. But what Alibaba through Tmall and its subsidiaries does, it allows a uh, young working professional in Beijing the ability to order an apple from Washington. So what it does is it puts in front of the end consumer, the end user, the ability to make decisions about what they want to buy and who they want to buy it from that never existed before. It has essentially blown away the traditional uh, distribution system in China where you, know, you sell to a wholesaler who sells to a regional company, who sells to a retailer, who sells to a local market. It's, it's blown that away and it has given an individual in any city, anywhere in the world, the ability to connect with a producer. So it doesn't matter what you produce, you have the ability to tie in and connect directly <coughs> with the end user. And this allows for uh, uh, establishment of new kinds of relationships that couldn't be thought of just a few years ago. And then you turn it around. We have all these people using the internet uh, we actually have the ability to identify uh, which person in uh, Guangzhou, China, might want an apple. And as was discussed earlier, I don't think we're quite to the point of delivering the apple before they decide they want it. <laughs> but uh, we certainly have the ability to do that. We can identify who's searched apples online, who's looked at Washington, and we can micro-target we can actually find that end user and push them to order the specific product or service from us. And uh, it has totally, totally changed you know, global distribution of consumer goods, of agricultural products, of technology, of professional services. It has just turned upside down the traditional way by which someone outside of this country buys a product or service. And it has given us tremendous opportunity to, again, not only wait for that order from an individual in a country to come to us, but to seek them out globally. Uh, fascinating. Uh, I spent a lot of time when I was in China uh, with the Alibaba folks and the Tmall folks, what they're doing with seafood, agricultural products, wine. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling how they're, they're, they're turning this around. The other trend uh, that I want to just uh, touch on briefly is the change in regulations globally. Fair trade agreements have taken down many of the tariffs, have reduced uh, the complexities of importing and exporting, and really have allowed us to uh, reach our end consumers much more efficiently. Uh, the free trade agreement with Korea, a lot of people simply don't understand how that has given us access to so many products and services into the Korean market that before were, were limited because of tariffs and, and regulatory export control, <coughs> excuse me, export controls over them. Another interesting form of deregulation relates to um, financing. Uh, it used to be that you know, developing complex letters of credit these relationships with foreign banks and things were inhibitors for uh, people exporting. Now you do your international banking with a visa card. You can literally work your existing financial instruments and have
have all of the foreign currency transactions attended to and completed with something that you have in your wallet today. So, so the changes in regulations, banking, things like that have opened up tremendous opportunity. So anyway, those are three areas that I think have dramatically, uh, profoundly changed the global market and give Southwest Washington opportunity and access. And I can't emphasize enough the, the value of the Washington brand. Thank you kindly, Skyler. In the interest of uh, having as many questions from the audience, I'm, I'm gonna skip over some of my uh, awkward questions for the moment. I'll come back to them if we dry up. But uh, if any of you have questions, uh, please feel free to put your hand up. I'll select uh, as many as we can get through. Maybe uh, introduce uh, yourself, your company, just, for, you know, just five seconds. And please uh, specify who the question is for or whether it's straight to the panel. We'll start off uh, right at the front, sir. Jerry Oliver, reporter, Vancouver. Alyssa, nice to see you back on our side of the river at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, the uh, uh, two things uh, in your nationwide recruitment efforts or targeting of, of industries or companies. What kinds of uh, industries are you, are you seeking to relocate to our metro area? And the other part of the question is: Is there physically land available? So thanks for that. So uh, with Greater Portland, what we work to do is recognize on a regional basis what are the top, what we call industry clusters. So what are those industries that really filter across the region and have the biggest economic impact? And typically, those, and what we specifically focus on are traded sector companies. And so Tim is a professional service, more of a service provider. They aren't making a good that is typically exported. We could get into the nuance of that. Services can be exported, but typically what we think about is someone who makes something that is exported because you're bringing new revenues into the economy that then grow the pot. So just wanted to lay that foundation for you. That is the basic tenant of the industries we're going after. And so for Greater Portland right now, we, we say we have four industries or clusters that are unique to our region that really give us a competitive advantage. They're advanced manufacturing, and specifically when I say that, we look at the semiconductor industry, you think of the behemoth of Intel, but think of all of those companies that supply Intel and what kind of a robust infrastructure we have there. We also have a strong metals industry, I think Far West speaks to that. The other components we look at is the software industry, that is growing um, significantly, that knowledge-based economy we heard a lot about this morning. And then the other two are athletic and outdoor and clean tech. But for me right now in our organization, we're focusing on those first two of advanced manufacturing and software. So that's the question of what you're asking and what we're going to. And so right now within the software industry, we are seeing significant momentum coming from the Bay Area. And I brought my article here in terms of the outrageous costs that are going on there are just hitting a tipping point and they cannot sustain growth. But what's really interesting is what's really emerging, and this is what this article is here, is the backlash from the community. So if you want to witness have versus have not economy, it is truly remarkable down there. And so they're frustrated that you've heard about the Google shuttles or the Facebook shuttles. They're pulling up in front of the traditional public transit buses at public transit stops. And so it's, it's truly remarkable it physically manifesting this have and have not in the community is starting to have a significant backlash against these companies. It's going to be very hard for them to continue to grow there, and we are a natural outlet for that. And what's important for that knowledge-based economy is the level of salaries with these people. So it might not be as many people, but the salary has a large multiplier effect. They can support a lot of other than professional service industries, from your graphic designers to your engineers to whatever. So it's called a significant multiplier effect, and that's why that knowledge-based economy is so important to us. So that's one sector we're looking at. We're also going after industries within manufacturing. We are still your best low-cost option on the West Coast, and we've got two great ports, access to Asia. So what we're looking at also is really letting the nation know, especially California, I can't tell you how many times I've heard 
from site selectors. They're, they're consultants that represent companies who want to find a new location. And many of them say, I have California clients that simply want to be out of California. So we are working with those people to let them know we are a great option. We are a great option for those companies. We have incredible utility <coughs> rates, electricity rates, and reliable power. Reliability is highly important for those high-tech manufacturers. And we've got a clean and um, a strong supply of water. Again, it's awful what's going on in California. I think they're predicting driest year 500 years or something down there. The third component we're, we're studying, it's not formally part of our um, industry, is food processing. So Skylar was talking a lot about um, what we have in terms of agri agricultural products. The other element of that that we should be thinking about is what we call the value add sector. So the specialty food products. And that is growing remarkably, 20% um, growth in the past couple years within this industry. And what is incredible about that is within the Asian market, as we've heard about, is that middle class growing um, demographic that is buying a lot of these. Plus you layer on food safety concerns, you've got a great industry to really start looking at and exploring. So that's what we're looking at as well. And it's really a great Oregon, Washington play, it's Pacific Northwest based on our high quality brands and our reputation in that US um, uh, brand that really sells well. Um, regarding the land, that's a very important question, and that speaks again to that food processing question. We don't have well, we don't have cheap land or cheap utilities for your big food processor. Typically, what you think about canning tomatoes or pears <coughs> or so forth, that's going to be more in our rural uh, areas of Oregon and probably Washington. Yakima sees a lot of that, so we need to look at what is going to fit within our regional profile, what really makes sense for us, and that's why the software works well, but also repurposing some of our existing fabs. We're doing that with the recruitment client right now. Um, and we do have large lots in certain areas, and we're studying that right now. We're looking at a large lot site analysis. So who wants to be in our region in a large, lights, large site so we can actively go target that? Great, thank you. Um, the gentleman uh, was right behind you, and then I'll get to you. I'm Paul Greenlee, I'm the city council for Rashubal, which is a city of 14,000 people. We have 84 employees, about a $35 million a year budget. I admit it's a failure on my part, but I can't think of anything we can export. On the other hand, my real question is, what can we as a community do better than we're doing now to help you, to help Skyler, to, to make the, some, some more economic prosperity for our community, for Clark County, and for the Portland metro region. What can a city or any municipality do to make things better? I think I'm just going to qualify that. Maybe, maybe um, we can run, run down the panel, but you also might want to spell out what you can do to uh, to help uh, this gentleman's uh, city as well as Skyler. To effectively sell a product globally or even you know across the street at the uh, AM PM market, you've got to have something people want to buy. So what, what in my experience is government hasn't been particularly effective in terms of deciding what people want to buy and, and saying this is what you should make or do. Where we've been very effective is we've been taking people who have good ideas, who have products, who have innovation, uh, who offer services. And this is something that I would, I would emphasize <coughs> because the demand globally for products is, is very well understood, but there's an equal demand for services. So, so when there is something <coughs> of value, when there is a good idea, a good product, we certainly can help in terms of opening doors. We can assist in terms of uh, accessing markets. There are certain things we can do in terms of startup business support, attracting new industries. But uh, I, I'm hesitant, Paul, to say that you know we can give you the idea that you can take back to Washougal today that will be the next best thing. But we, we do have a great deal of expertise. Uh, in terms of you know, fostering a 
supporting great ideas. And um, we are working very closely with organizations like CREDC and the Chambers to make sure that those good ideas bubble up and get the time and attention of uh, uh, people in the state system. And I know you didn't ask for Vancouver, and I saw Dave Britton was back here earlier, but from my perspective, it's really the city municipality's responsibility to create a vision. And you've got to create that vision around what economic development and vitality looks like in your community. And then once you've developed that, now you've got to create the avenue to get there. So you know, one of the things that we see uh, time and time again is, for instance, industrial properties don't pay for themselves. So you need to have that access to the state funds or the federal funds or local funds or the partnerships in order to help make those developments come true. And then if you've got a long-term partner, whether that's a long-term developer or a port district or whoever, they can help to, with that infrastructure and that longer-term investment so that companies can come in to purchase that property or lease that property and, and, and move forward. What I see time and time again is, is well, because these companies are really good at doing their business, they don't think very far ahead of when they're going to locate or where they need to have their next plant. In our permitting processes today, realistically, it takes 24 to 36 months really to get a building on the ground if you aren't if you aren't already had some pre-permitting in place. And so, if you've got that in place, if you've got your footprint there, if you if maybe you've done some pre-permitting so that they can just come in and build a building, now if you're talking 12 months okay, I, they're, they're more interested and they're able to respond to that. If you can do six months, that's fantastic. So once you've got that set up, then you have to get that information out. And I think that's where GPI and CRUC and those can help as well, as well as the site selectors. But really us investing in that infrastructure is key to making sure that people understand that we see the vision and that we support that vision. So I've got about five points to make. <laughs> um, uh, frankly, Make them rapidly. Sure. <laughs> I would say that, um, particularly in Washington, you can't create a market. Um, there are folks in your community who think that they can, um, because they have an idea of what would be great here, try to create it. You have to kind of deal with what you have and make the best of what you've got. Creating your own market um, is, uh, is a very challenging thing. So I think you have, the other thing I would add to that is that productive change doesn't provide instant results. I would say your community is well positioned. You, frankly, you have probably the largest supply of shovel-ready industrial land ready to go uh, in the county, arguably, for, for your market. Um, the port's done a fantastic job of setting up. The question, to Todd's point, is what do you want that to look like? Um, visions of glass towers and class A office space probably isn't necessarily appropriate for Washougal. So trying to target that it would be hard to accomplish. Um, so a lot of good things are already happening there. Uh, I would say that Washougal particularly is to think about um, continuing to improve great separated rail crossings. Um, regardless whether there's a terminal at the port for oil, there is going to be a substantial increase in rail traffic. Um, if BNSF creates their one-way loop, the rail volume in this community will be high, and we're all advised to look out that decade or two and think about how we can accommodate rail as opposed to try to stem it. Um, so th that, those are hard things to do. Um, the other thing I would add is that what Washougal and other communities can do here is um, the one thing I would suggest we stop exporting, and that's exporting talent. Um, our, our, uh, we have some of the best K-12 education in the state and the region. And um, maybe it's down to my um, colleague on the end of the table, uh, our, our you know, legislature in Washington and the governor could reinstate things like uh, the state scholar program. Um, for example, it used to be that in Washington State, if you were a, a National Merit Scholar, you got free tuition in Washington, any university you wanted. They cut that program. Um, my son is going to the University of Colorado, Oklahoma, because every National Merit Scholar in the country is offered a scholarship in Oklahoma. And you know, I have the two schools my kids split to, Mountain View and Union, top 20 students, I think 18 of those graduating students left the state for higher, for higher ed. So we make great fundamental decisions about growing talent, which industry wants, but if we don't capture them and retain them, educate them here, and they leave, they don't come back. So we have a great, the talent stream here is a great front end. It's the back end that we're, that we're, we're, we're holding on. 
So I know showing Washington University grow or, 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 or for Washington to encourage the state higher ed to invest in itself doesn't feel like direct in Washington, but it will benefit us all. So we should, that, that STEM with the talent exit is a concern for me. Okay. I just wanted to add one element. Um, so grossly overlooked, one of the significant initiatives for Greater Portland Inc. is we are working with the Brookings Institute Portland region was recognized as one of four in the nation as one of the highest growing in terms of exports. So what we've done is instituted a program that's been in place for a year to work with all the local communities within the region to get them the tools and the resources so they can go back to their small businesses and help them start exporting so that they can start growing their revenues. So that's a concrete way of helping us, one, be aware that exports are a great opportunity to grow your revenue base, but then how do you get there as well? So that's one of the initiatives. Okay, over to the lady with the striking necklace. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Maureen Winningham. I'm in charge of global learning for Intel Security. So thanks for the call outs for Intel. I'm going to piggyback off of several things that each one of you have said, Tim, um, with STEM education. So we can either buy or build our great engineers that are going to support our software and semiconductor businesses that grow here green. Um, how do we attract more students into STEM? You had a great idea. I'd like to hear more. I'd like to hear from pre-K up to um, university. There's already positive change happening. I actually I give uh, two people in, in the community a big um, uh, congratulations. That would be Scott Keeney and Ben Bagmore. Uh, Enlight and SH America are working with Evergreen School District specifically <coughs> to encourage that educational shift you know, kids make a decision at sixth, seventh yeah. grade to, to, to take that harder math, harder science, and, and there's this recognition at the school district level of industry that people are making a, well, I'll never go to college, so I don't stay on that track. Then, whether they go to college or not, you'll talk to Scott and Ben, and they'll tell you, you don't necessarily have to have a college education to thrive and make a healthy wage. Well, I heard the same thing from the VP of Bose Commercial um, Jet uh, Division. They said, you can make $80,000 a year as a machinist, you don't need a college degree, but you got to know math, physics, and chemistry. You have to. So how do we communicate to our parents and our young people about staying on the STEM path? Um, I would love to see uh, companies like Boeing or larger corporations adopt what I would call a, a high school curriculum that says, this is the Boeing high school curriculum. You know, if you've accomplished these these classes in high school, you get through this 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 this, this level of education, regardless of college, you're you could have a career here. And we, you know, what do you call it, the Keck program? I mean, the, the STEM is a great topic, but how do you have a kid at sixth or seventh grade to understand what their job could be and what they could make? And uh, I think we, because you can have a great STEM education, not go to college, have a great living, but to graduate high school with no STEM and no college education. You look at those unemployment numbers, and they're significantly different um, for no education or no college, um, much less the STEM. Anyone else? Well, having uh, served on the school board for several years, uh, I have a few thoughts on that. Um, I, I think we've done a much better job in recent years in terms of creating the opportunity for kids to avail themselves of STEM classes all the way down to middle school, with an emphasis on you know, different kinds of math, motivating kids through high school with uh, you know, some of the more practical opportunities. Clark College does a great job in terms of offering real training. WSU Vancouver, you can get advanced degrees in these areas. So I think we have made significant progress. More needs to be done. More investments need to be made in terms of uh, you know, the capacity to produce people that have these skills. Having, again, been part of the educational process for many years, one thing I want to point out is we need to do more to convince families to work with their kids to move them in these directions because uh, while we do have much better capacity, still kids are not availing themselves of the great AP classes in the Vancouver School District or the special programs that might be at Clark. People are not availing themselves of it. So I think 
we have a responsibility as a community and as parents to really, really let kids know what this kind of quality education means. And I will admit to uh, some failures in this regard because my younger son now, who's graduated from the University of Washington, is like, Dad, why didn't you push me to do more practical things? And, and, and again, it really brought home to me the need for you know, families to talk about this and motivate their, their kids to pursue these kinds of things. Capacity is there, but uh, motivation is where we really, really need to put some emphasis. Well, thank you, Scott. I think uh, we're going to uh, have to stop it there. I did want to give each of the panelists 30 seconds to uh, leave you with a parting thought though, or a comment. So, uh, Elisa. Um, my parting thought, I would echo John Roberts' earlier um, comment. I am really, really positive about where this region can go. I think we have significant opportunities, and I'm thrilled to be working with the entire region, Clark County, Vancouver, the entire metro region. I think that the uh, market is bright and local. I think that the last of 14 and 15 will be a tremendous economic opportunity locally. Don't let that um, anesthetize your motivation to explore new markets. Um, when it gets better here, we tend to maybe be happy with that. And I think there's a real opportunity for you to think here as well as outside our region. Yeah, and I guess I'll just add that uh, I, I think as well that we've got some really great opportunities in front of us. We're really poised for greatness. Uh, the thing that we all, I think, as a community need to remember is that we're not we're in this together. So we need the partnerships. And when I come back to partnerships, there's many forms of that. But the key one for us is that we need to partner with our local communities, with our state, with our fed, federal government on infrastructure. <coughs> and I think that sometimes they understand what it is we're trying to accomplish, but I think sometimes we fell short of re recognizing that without that infrastructure, we're not providing the platforms for businesses to grow. We're not providing the platform for um, businesses to be attracted to this area. So we really need that legislative support. We really need that community support when we go to develop that infrastructure. And my final thought is don't let the preconceived notions about the difficulties of exporting and participating in the global marketplace hold you back. Things have changed. We took 103 businesses, uh, educational institutions, economic development organizations to China last November, and 103 individuals came back with opportunities that they identified because they saw that the game has changed, the dynamic has changed, and some of those factors that I mentioned before are opening up new opportunities. So I think the biggest problem for a lot of people in terms of realizing opportunity uh, in the global marketplace are, are the preconceived notions of the past. And a big thank you to our panelists.